Dr. Joyce Bluford. Most kids call me Dr. Joyce. Why I'm called doctor is that I'm a scientist. Now, I don't study animals, but I do love animals. And so um, I learned a lot here working at Tule Ponds. So I'm a scientist who studies the earth, and that is called a geologist. So I am here with all these little animals here, and we're going to go through Tule Ponds. Now, if you live in Fremont, we live near the Fremont BART station, and we have a pond and a um, lake. So we're going to take a look at some of these. So let's keep going on. Now, first we're going to learn that there's two types of animals. There's animals with a, what is this called? What do you have back there? Can everybody feel their back? That is a backbone. So there's animals in Fremont that have a backbone. Like this little frog here, does a frog have a backbone? Yes, it does. So this belongs to a group of animals that we see in number four, the one that's in the red. Those are, call, those are what we call vertebrates. Let's say that word vertebrates. That means animals with a backbone. So I'll call it a backbone. Now look at the blue. The blue are animals with not a backbone. Now, so if you have a ladybug, does a ladybug have a backbone? No, it doesn't have, it has a, it doesn't have a skeleton like we do. So we have now, are, do we, are we an animal with a backbone? Is this your backbone? Yes, we are an animal with a backbone. And we're going to learn is that there's five different animal types that live in Fremont that have a backbone. Let's see if you can think of them. One swims in the water. Those are called fish. Got it. S some fly. And those are called birds. They have a backbone. Then there's animals that hop around and lay their eggs in the water. Those are amphibians, like a frog. And then there's ones that slither. Those are reptiles. Then there is us, of course, and things like, um, like a raccoon. Where'd my raccoon go? I have a raccoon. A raccoon would be a one um, a mammal. So those are the five groups of animals with backbones. And then there's a whole lot of animals without a backbone. And we're going to see they tend to be small, like a worm, like a um, uh, different types of little little things like ants. Okay, now. This is just make believe that you're kind of going up in the air and you're looking down. This is a picture of Tule Ponds at Tyson's Lagoon. The big lagoon is called Tyson's Lagoon. And then there's three little ponds. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at where these animals might live. So where does a fish live? A fish has to live in, got it, water. A bird can be found anywhere because they can fly, they can swim in the water. Amphibians, or the frog type animals, they live, um, they live in water and land. And then you have reptiles and mammals, and they live on the land. And then animals without backbones, they live all over the place here at Tule Ponds. So let's take a kind of a look. So make believe you're still up there looking down. This is our pond. It's called Tyson's Lagoon. And now remember, you don't see any animals right now because what is underneath there? Those are fish. And we're gonna look at some of these fish that we have here. But you notice there's a lot of trees. Now it's important that you have an ant, for animals to live in the wild, you have to have things like trees and food for the animals. So Tulipon is very, very popular for the animals here. Now, 
let's fly over tulip ponds. So make believe you're drifting up and let's see what we can see. As we're going into parts of the tulies, you see those long things in the background? They're not the tree, those are trees, the real tall ones, but the ones that are near the water, those are called tulies. And tulies tend to be very, very important for animals, especially like birds. So let's keep flying. Oh, you can see some of the ducks in the water, but most of the animals you can't see. And this one doesn't have sound, so you can't hear them. But as we go see and, and visit other parts of Thule Pounds, Ponds, we're going to see that a lot of them make a lot of sound. Now, many animals live here in Thule Ponds because we have one thing. What is that flowing? That is water. Water is important for all living animals, including ourselves. So water, especially when it rains, it will come into Thule Ponds and make it bigger for animals to come. So we get a lot of animals here just because we have water. Some of them just come at night because they want to just rest. And when they get up in the morning, they might want a little fish to eat and then they'll leave. So we have animals that are coming and going day and night. We're kind of like a hotel. Now, also we have areas that sometimes have water all the time. Now, what was that sound? Well, that sound was of different birds that live here at Tule Ponds. And so it depends on the time of the day. Some birds like to come out at night, some come in during the day, some come at noon. We always have a host of visitors here at Tule Ponds. Now, let's take a look. Why do we have a lot of animals here? Now, we have a lot of animals because one thing I said was water. The other thing is... At Tule Ponds, we plant a variety of different plants from milkweed to mallows to help bring back certain insects. So this is an area where children maintain, mainly teenagers, and it allows the native animals to come back. So we have lots of plants. Now, can you believe you've seen those pictures up in the airplane when you were looking down? 25 years ago, there was nothing here. There was very few sounds and there was no vegetation. There was no plants. And so what happened was our group, we're a group of scientists that wanted to give back to the community. So we got a lot of teenagers in the community and we started to plant trees. And this is what we have now. You plant the trees, you provide the water and you get animals. Now, let's take a look. We have a place here called the Butterfly Meadow. Let's take a look at a plant called a marshmallow. Now, think marshmallow, you think of something to eat that's sweet. Do we have a plant with marshmallows growing? Let's see. This is looking at the Butterfly Meadow, which is about an acre of different types of plants. The one we're walking toward is a marsh mallow. The early Native Americans would eat the root, they would roast it, and would have the flavor of today's marsh mallow. Marsh meaning wet, and mallow is the type of plant. The painted lady loves this plant. Now, who is the painted lady? Well, the painted lady is a butterfly that visits us during the springtime, and it loves these plants. Now, if we didn't have these plants, they wouldn't visit us. So what we're going to do is, so this painted lady, which is a butterfly, belongs to the invertebrates. It does not have a backbone. And so we're going to read you a little story on the Painted Lady. So the next time the spring times come, you might be able to identify it. The Painted Lady 
Species name, Vanessa Carduti. By Joyce Bluford, animated by Doris Rea and Hagos Tavolti. Vanessa found a lilac chrysalis, the pupa stage a caterpillar made, attached to a mallow plant hanging under a leaf for shade. A few days before, the caterpillar, dark brown, spiny with light stripes, kept eating and shedding its skin, looking like different types. The caterpillar knew, after three weeks or so, chemicals in its body will signal it's time to go. Hanging motionless, with fits of a wig and a wag, the caterpillar was changing in its little sleeping bag. Weeks before, a female painted lady laid her little green eggs. A caterpillar emerged in a week, crawling on its many legs. A month before they moved to the north, the butterflies took flight. They migrated from the south in spring. It was a miraculous sight. Vanessa was wise and let the chrysalis be. As the lilac turned reddish brown, the wing colors you could now see. The chrysalis began to peel and emerged a butterfly. The blood from its abdomen pumped the wings to fly. The painted lady was beautiful, thought Vanessa to herself. The lady could fly and even land on a shelf. The lady looked for flowers so its proboscis could suck up food. When night arrives, they keep warm in a brood. Vanessa witnessed metamorphosis and was proud that she can see. She now knew the secrets of how a butterfly came to be. So this is the end of the little poem. And this shows the life cycle of the painted lady. It goes from egg to caterpillar to chrysalis to butterfly. And it continues on and on. The end. So why I read this little poem here was so that you realize that sometimes animals change. And so sometimes when you see that if you have a butterfly, that means just a few weeks before it might have been a caterpillar and they look so differently. Now, these are pictures here from Fremont. And if you look at picture number one, those are thousands of butterflies coming over tulipans. Now remember, they need water. So that's why they come over here. But if you look at number three, you see those little, little dots? Those are the eggs. So sometimes these are all around us, but we just can't see them. And that's one of the things that in order to see these animals, a lot of times you have to be quiet and you have to use your eyes to look. Now we also have another famous butterfly here called the monarch butterfly. And here we have um, milkweed. Now here in Fremont, we used to have lots of milkweeds. Butterflies used to come from all over the place to come with the, the, the milkweed and to eat it, but we don't have as many anymore. But here at Tulipons, we grow it, so we attract the butterfly, the monarch. So they have special food they need to eat, and so you have to put the food that they like. Now milkweed, if you look up in the upper right hand corner, you see a kind of like a milky substance. That's what they're, that's the kind of plant. If a plant bleeds what looks like milk, it's a milkweed. This is a male monarch. You can see that it has these dart dots. You can see they have a little um, relief to them. Those are where they have pheromones to uh, attract the female. So this is a male. A male means that it's a boy. So there's a girl and a boy butterfly. So in this case, if you observe those little dots, that's what tells you that's a boy monarch butterfly. Now also, if you see these, now the one on the, the colorful one with the white and the black 
and the yellow. Notice the pattern. It keeps repeating itself. That's how I know that will be a monarch butterfly one of these days. And also that little egg over there, it's um, a kind of a white color. And notice it has little ridges on it. That's how I know it's a monarch egg. So you again, you have to observe. That's what scientists do well. We observe things and we try to remember them. Now let's look at another kind of animal here at Tulipons without a backbone. Now, you guys probably know what a crab is and a lobster. Well, Fremont has its own baby crayfish. Along the creeks, you can encounter many organisms. Let's look closer. This crayfish is afraid we might attack, so it's getting in a defense if you Position. notice, it has its claws out like that, and it's standing up, trying to make it look big. But those pinchers can actually pinch you pretty good, so unless you know how to grab them. But crayfish are here in Fremont, and you can sometimes find them, especially along creeks. Now, do we have a lot of other little critters? Now, if you look at this picture, you'd think, oh, it's just dirt. But let's look with our eyes and really see stuff. Spiders, worms, and ants all over the place doing their job. And what is their job? They go to work? Yeah, they do. They work for us. They basically make the soil good so then that we can grow things without good soil and without other little organisms making it uh, nutritious for the plants, we wouldn't have any plants. And so these little critters are important. Now, let's take a look at the animals here that, or the, the ones with, what is this group, the red group? It is the animals with, what's that thing called? A backbone. So we're going to take a look at some of the animals here in, at tulipons that belong to these groups. Oh my goodness, what is that peeking? Okay, question, is that a raccoon, an opossum, or a squirrel? They all live here at Tule Ponds and in uh, Fremont. It's a raccoon because it has, what did it have? It had those bandit type eyes looking like that. So that tells you it's a raccoon. Now, he was hiding underneath the building here. We have a classroom here at Tule Ponds. So it was hiding, but it usually comes out at night. We call those kind of animals nocturnal. So it eat and it eats, remember that crayfish you saw? They know how to get them by the back and eat them. So they have their own lobsters that they need, that they eat. Now, what is this? Can you see the animal? It's up in the tree and it is eating black walnuts, which is their special um, nut that they like. Can you see it? This is one of our squirrels. The gray squirrel is our native squirrel. We have some other squirrels here. We also have ground squirrels um, that usually, uh, they can climb up, but they will make their burrows in the ground. These kind of tree squirrels will make their homes up in the trees. And we have lots of homes of our tree squirrels here because we have so many nuts here. They love tulipons. Now, what is this? Let me play the little. Do you see them? Now that sound was of a um, kind of like a duck uh, cooing, um, but this, that was a fish. 
We have many fish here that live at Tule Ponds. And the reason they like it here, if you notice, those were little baby fish. And the, what they were going around was things called tules. Tule is a plant that helps hide them. And then there's little organisms that live within the tule plant and the fish will eat them. And so there's this, all of these animals kind of live together. It's what we call a food web. Something eats something else that eats something else, and they all take care of each other. So this is an important habitat or environment or place to live. Now, so that was fish. Does a fish have a backbone? Yes, we might not think about it, but the next time you have a fish, look, and they have little bones in it. That tells you it has a backbone. Now, can you see? The frog? Now, that is a tree frog. Now, this is a little puppet of a tree frog. frog. Now, if you notice, it has web feet, just like the example there. Now these are really teeny weeny. I mean, this is a puppet, but those little suckers here, these, these suction cups will hold on to the tree and the tree frog can climb a tree. That's why it's called a tree frog. Now this guy here is a bull frog. Now he's pretty big, but he doesn't have those little um, uh, su su suction cups at the end. So do you think this guy can go up a tree? No. So this is called our tree frogs. You have to be around uh, wet areas because they lay their eggs. And when their eggs hatch, they are called tadpoles. And if you look in the, the, the little picture there, that's a tadpole of a tree frog. Now, what's this? don't make much sounds and they just sit there until they try to escape from you but this is our bullfrogs um, bullfrogs are not native they don't belong here but they there's so many of them that they're part of the food web now I'm going to read you a little story about frog tails. This way you get an idea of how frogs and what they eat. Now remember, do frogs have backbones? Yes. Let's take a look at frog tails. Frog tails by Michael Daughtery, animated by Doris Rea and ha Hagos Tavolti. Notice in this picture that there are one species of frogs with yellow eyes and one species of frog with blue eyes. Amphibian's poem. A male green frog sings his song. He sings it loud. He sings it long. Notice what that means is that only the boy frog or the male sings and the girl listens. He calls from his pond to attract a mate. He wants to have a special date. So he's looking for a girlfriend. The females choose whoever they like. Compared to her, he's a little tyke. The female frog is much larger than the male or boy frog. The amplexus is the long hug she'll get. The egg she deposits must stay wet. So frogs have this funny way of reproducing, um, which no other uh, group of organisms do this. The male squeezes the egg. Unlike a chicken that just lays an egg, the male frog needs to squeeze them out of her. In about a week, tadpoles hatch, thousands of them in a single batch. If you notice that the little frogs are in the eggs, they must be in water.
Metamorphosis is an amazing change as tadpoles grow into things so strange. So they start from the egg and then they come out, they form these gills, and then they almost look like a fish and they actually act like a fish. They get their dissolved oxygen from the water. Legs appear as their tail go away. New things will grow day by day. So if you notice that their tail gets smaller, their uh, hind legs come out first, then their front legs. Gills go away as lungs breathe air. They can stay out of water if they dare. So now their lungs have developed where they now can breathe but they are not like humans that breathe out of their mouth. They need to breathe from their skin. In about two years, they are fully grown to look for a pond they can call their own. So this is a green frog. Every frog has a different life cycle. Um, so it takes two years for a green frog to come out of the water and to be a fully grown adult frog. The end. I hope you like my poem. Now I would like to share some information from my new book. And what's her book? The cookbook. Hey, isn't that a cookbook? Who cares about that? Notice the blue eyed frog looks pretty bored. Remember when your teeth formed when you were about a month old? I gave you a homework assignment to memorize a list of things you can eat. Does anybody remember what tadpoles eat? Now first, frogs do have teeth. They're very small and they're in the back, but they do choose their food. Now let's see what tadpoles eat. Remember they're in the water. Algae, which is little green plants, and zooplankton, so little organisms that are in the water. That blue-eyed frog looks pretty bored. What do frogs eat? Zooplankton, insects. Hmm, so they eat the same except they don't eat, um, but they added insects to their diet. That's it, can we go home now? And bad little frogs, class dismissed. Notice that um, amphibian actually ate the bored little blue-eyed frog. And that's because that is what happens in nature. The end as the grief green frog hops away. So there's a whole life cycle in here um, where they grow, they eat things, they eat each other and new frogs come back. So here at Tulipons, frogs are real important because they're food for, who do you think eats them? The birds. Now let's go frog hunting here at Tulipons. Gotta be quiet guys. Let's see if we can find any frogs in this area. Notice right after the rains. Oops. I just heard something jump. That little peeper sound, that is a frog. Catching them on film is not the easiest thing in the world. So let's see. Let me go up closer. Mm. There's a whole bunch of frogs in here. <gasps> There's, see bullfrog? That was a big one. That was about a two pounder. A two pound frog? Yes, they can get that big, especially the bullfrogs. That's why this puppet of a bullfrog is really big. But you see how you have to be quiet? You have to, they, 
camouflage. That means they look like the background. They're really hard to find. And so going frog hunting here in Fremont, you have to be quiet and you have to go by a stream that might have them. Now, let's take a look at reptiles. Now, a reptile can be a snake or a turtle. Do we have turtles here in Fremont? Yes, especially here at Tule Ponds, we have what is called the Western Pond Turtle. You don't see many of them, um, but they, they've been here for a long, long time. Now, do reptiles have backbones? Yes, remember, they have our animals with backbones. Now, let's take a look. Now, look at that picture there. Do you see it? Let's see if we can find the turtle. There it is, guys. Looks like it's part of the mud. Oh my goodness, but they are all over the place. They lay their eggs here. We have baby turtles here, and we try to protect them as much as we can. But baby turtles are eaten quite a bit by the birds because when they come out their um, back, um, their shell, now remember that shell is part of their backbone, but it is not the backbone itself. It is pr kind of protecting it, and a turtle cannot come out of that, sh that shell at all turtles need it and when people paint turtles that's not good either because that is a living part of the turtle that's like painting our skin uh, something and expecting it to come out not a good idea now what's another reptile that we have here uh-oh what are those called snakes now we have two major types of snakes here one called the Pacifer gopher snake and one called the garden snake. Uh, let's see, I'm going to show you a video soon of one of them, but let's see if we can tell the difference from one to another. Like I said, scientists observe and that's how they can start telling the difference. Now, the gopher snake, the one on the left, is got little, look on the back, it has little squares on its back where the garden snake gardener snake has long stripes. Now let's take a look at one here at Thule that's moving. Figure out if it's a gopher or a gardener. And these can get up to eight feet long. What do you think guys? It's a gopher. It has the little squares on the back. And these you find, um, they're in Fremont, but they like tall grass. Wiggling through. <laughs> That's where you would find them, in grass. And so this one just happened to come out, and we were able to film it. So, but they are long. But are they dangerous? No. These guys are very benign. The only dangerous snake we have is a rattlesnake here in Fremont. But those are in the warmer, uh, drier areas. They do not like water. So we don't have any rattler snakes. So any snake that you see here at Tule Ponds is okay. Now, what we're going to do now is birds. Remember, we just went through what's the ones that are um, ourselves would be like a mammal, like a raccoon. Then we saw the fish. Then we saw the amphibians. Then we saw, what was the other one that we saw? We saw fish and, and reptiles. Now we're going to look at birds. Birds are the major bigger vertebrates that live in this area because it's like a resting home for them. They don't have to have they don't have to bother people bothering them. They don't have to worry about getting run over by a car. They can just come hang around. They can even have their babies here because we don't um, disturb them too much. Now, let's take a look at um, uh, some geese. Now, we have mainly in Fremont, we have the wild Canadian geese. But look at this. Gimpy is the resident goose. He's an African goose that came about five years ago. He cannot fly. And every year he always picks two, a male and a female and they're chicks and he watches over them like a nanny. 
So this year, these are the lovely. So Gimp, uh, Gimpy, couple. and actually we found out Gimpy is not an African geese. He's a, a domesticated gray log uh, goose, which is the wild part. Canada geese, on the other hand, are wild. They're all over the place. So you don't see too many of the domesticated um, goose, but somebody just left him here um, because they probably, a lot of times the goose they will eat, and I guess somebody didn't want to have it for its dinner and just left it here. It does not fly, so it's been here, and geese can live up to 30 years, so we might have gimpy for a while. But let's look at the difference. I want you guys to observe. This is important, especially the birds, is to look for characteristics or things that can help identify them. Let's look at these. Which one is the domesticated gray log goose is the one on the left. That's Gimpy. Now notice Gimpy has white tail, uh, white feathers in the back. It has kind of this gray buff on the side and its feet are what color? Their feet are kind of an orange pink. Now look at its head. Its head is different than the Canada geese too. Its eyes are on the side as most geese, but then it has a orange beak with black on it. On it. If it was a wild goose, it would be pure, a, a, a wild gray log goose, it would be pure orange. And then notice the little white feathers. Those are feathers right above its um, beak. That is characteristic of um, a gray log goose. Now let's look at the Canada goose. Is it different? Yes, it has a black beak. It has black legs and it has white. The only uh, similarities is that it has white feathers underneath, just like Gimpy does. But its back is more uh, darker gray and black. So some people call these, uh, they, they kind of resent, they're in the swan, a goose is in, a, in the swan family. So, uh, and it has longer and they're skinnier and they're not good to eat versus the, uh, the domesticated goose has um, uh, has more meat on it. So now let's take a look at these characteristics again, or let's listen to something. So it has that honking sound, uh, which is different than the Canada geese. So you can identify these different birds by learning their color, their sound, their, how they're walking, if they're fat or thin. So birds are kind of neat to identify, but there's so many of them. Now, so this is a, um, an animation of it. We have an animator called Hagos who's on, on, on. Um, video chat and he created now notice how even artists have to observe what they look like in order to make them realistic so notice that the um, the beak has the black in it it has the white feathers it has the white underneath it it has that dark buff and this is how even if you like to do art you have to look at what you're drawing and try to make it realistic and sometimes that's how you can identify artists and scientists aren't very different they observe things scientists just make a conclusion and artists make a beautiful uh, picture now, what I'd like you to do, every morning we have a lot of ducks and we have learned, um, we've been feeding some of them. Now I want you to look at this and see if you see different types. These are called mallard ducks. Let's say that word, mallard ducks. So these are the ones that people go quack, quack, quack. So this is uh, our typical duck and they are wild. They're not um, domesticated ducks. Um, and so if you, hopefully you noticed how many types was there or two that you can put them in 
two different groups. There's ones with the green head and there's ones with the brown head. Let's take a look at some more pictures of these. Do you see these guys here? There was a white one. Did you see the white one with the puffy head on it? Um, I'm going to kind of play this again and kind of talk over it. Here is a weird looking duck with red eyes and green. And then we have the mallard ducks. Notice that the green one has a little fan. And then you have the mallard ducks that are kind of brown. That's because the green. Oh, look at this guy. He's got a, a poofy hairstyle. He's a, he's a newer duck that we have here. It looks like somebody, he can't fly, so somebody put him over here. Um, but if you look at the ducks, there's one with the, uh, the, the green. That is a boy duck, mallard duck. And then the ones that are all brown are the female. So sometimes color can tell you girl and boy. Sometimes it can't, but on the mallard ducks, it does. So what we'd like you guys to do on our hopefully your teachers or you can find it on our website this is we're going to make a mallard duck so you can be like this one is a boy and you can put it on your head and then you can walk around like a duck now if you want it to be a girl what would you color it you would color it like this so this would be brown this would be green and then you can have, and then we have information on it, so that you can always identify a girl duck and a boy mallard duck. And so um, this can help you kind of understand what we've learned today. Now, I also had, before anybody has some questions, I got a little surprise for you guys. Now that we learned all about, um, so I'm going to, uh, let's see, so our next one. Okay, now some of you guys saw these at the beginning, but what what is this guy here? And if you want more information about the little kittens, we'll stay online afterwards. But let's we're going to escape and stop share. And what is this, guys? Is it a reptile? Now reptile has um, is like a um, a turtle. Is this a turtle? So this is not a reptile, right? What is it? Is it a bird? Does it fly? No. If I let it go, whoop, it would come right back down to me. Doesn't fly. Does it hop like this guy here and have babies in the water? No. So it's not a amphibian. Now what's the other one? So we had a bird, right? We had amphibian right? We had reptile, right? Uh, I'm missing one. Oh my goodness. So what is this guy? It is a mammal. Now is this close to, now remember, does this little guy have a backbone on it? This is a little kitten here that was, um, that, uh, that was found here at Tule Ponds. I've domesticated them. So these guys are ready for adoption. Whoop. But does, does this have a backbone? You can see anything that stands up nice and straight needs to have a backbone. Now, tell me, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you some cats and you're going to have to tell me how many cats we have. Now, describe this one. It almost looks like a bandit, almost looks like a raccoon, but it's not. It is a like I said, a mammal. But let's look at the characteristics. It has white under here. How long is the is the fur long or short? Long. Look at the back legs. One is white and one is kind of white with black on it. And its tail is striped. So this is one cat, long haired. 
That's number one. Now, now this one is easy to identify. What's this color? Black. Okay, this one's all black. Now, is um, does it have any other things? Does it have short hair or long hair? Long hair. Okay, so this is long hair. So this is number two. Now, tell me if I have three cats or two cats. Is this guy different than the other one? Is this a new one? Does this one have long hair? No. Does it have the eyelids like that? No. So this is another cat. This is short hair. So how many cats did I have all together? Three. Okay, guys, this is going to conclude our presentation. I hope you learned a lot about these animals, and I hope that you can go around Fremont, especially walking around Lake Elizabeth or Alameda Creek, and you can find some of these. Tule Ponds is sometimes open. Um, we'll be open uh, tomorrow if you're interested in looking at the kitty cats, because I need to find them home. We'll be open from 9.30 to 11.30.